6.10 Hyperbolic Trigonometric Functions In this section we're discussing the hyperbolic trigonometric functions and their inverses. We'll start with two simple definitions. First we'll define the hyperbolic sine function which is just sin with an h appended and we'll define hyperbolic sine of x to be the real valued function e to the x minus e to the minus x divided by 2. Uh, notice because of the way this function is defined the domain is all real numbers and the range is also all real numbers. The second function we define is the hyperbolic cosine function which is e to the x plus e to the minus x divided by 2, which also has a domain, all real numbers. But if you uh, notice that e to the x and e to the minus x can never be negative, you'll see that the range of this function doesn't include any negative numbers. In fact, it can't be any smaller than 1 for the output value. So the range for this function will be 1 to infinity. From there, we will define four other hyperbolic trigonometric functions, and you can guess that they would be the other four so-called regular trig functions with h's appended. So there will be a hyperbolic tangent, a hyperbolic cotangent, a hyperbolic secant, and a hyperbolic cosecant. We define these in a way that's consistent with the way regular trig functions are defined. These will all be reciprocals of other functions. In the case of tangent though, we're going to define that probably in the way we would expect if we were thinking about uh, these functions being similar in behavior to regular trig functions. We'll define hyperbolic tangent to be hyperbolic sine divided by hyperbolic cosine. Notice that based on our earlier definitions, that would be e to the x minus e to the minus x divided by e to the x plus e to the minus x. We'll define hyperbolic cotangent to be the reciprocal of hyperbolic tangent. Similarly, hyperbolic sequent, secant will be the reciprocal of hyperbolic cosine. Hyperbolic cosecant will be the reciprocal of hyperbolic sine. Obviously now each of those six functions can be expressed in terms of e to the x and e to the minus x. Let's look at the graphs. And of course what we're suggesting here is that all these functions are built out of e to the x and e to the minus x, which are those two graphs. Uh, starting with hyperbolic sine, which is one half of the difference of the two. And point by point, if you were to take y values and subtract them, so for example, right here at 1, I would take e to the 1, which would be e, minus e to the minus 1, which would be 1 over e, divide that difference by 2, and I would get this y value. When I do that for all x's, I get the red graph, which is the graph of hyperbolic sine. What's the graph of hyperbolic cosine? It's the sum of the two functions divided by 2. And there's the red graph of hyperbolic cosine. Note that the range is 1 to infinity. How do I get hyperbolic tangent? I divide the two. Hyperbolic sine divided by hyperbolic cosine. Remember that if I get rid of those, this is hyperbolic sine. This is hyperbolic cosine. Dividing the two gives me this graph. If I take the reciprocal of hyperbolic tangent, I get hyperbolic cotangent. So the green graph you see is hyperbolic cotangent. If I take hyperbolic cosine, which is this one, and reciprocate it, I get hyperbolic secant. If I take hyperbolic sine, 
and take the reciprocal, I get hyperbolic cosecant. And then obviously if I take hyperbolic tangent and take the reciprocal, I get hyperbolic cotangent. Notice that for each of these functions, starting with hyperbolic sine, I should be able to construct an inverse function. So let's look at the graphs of the inverse functions as long as we're here. Here's the graph of hyperbolic sine. If I reflect over the blue colored line y equals x, I get the graph of the hyperbolic sine inverse function. If I take the graph of hyperbolic cosine, we have a small problem. Notice, of course, that that function's not one-to-one. -one. So we take the tack that we did in a previous section in restricting the domains of the regular inverse trig functions. In this case, I'll restrict the domain of the hyperbolic cosine function to simply zero to infinity. If you want to think of that as the positive half of that graph. So if I make that restriction and then reflect over the line y equals x, I get the graph of the inverse hyperbolic cosine function, which you see in blue. Okay, I don't have this one-to-one -one issue with any of the other functions. So for each of the other functions, here's hyperbolic tangent. Domain and range are both, well, the domain is all real numbers. I'll let you think about the range. But certainly if I reflect that over the line y equals x, I get this, which would be the graph of the inverse hyperbolic tangent function. Similarly, if I take the graph of the hyperbolic secant function, okay, I, I should say there is one other one that has a one to oneness problem, and it should make sense. It's the reciprocal of the cosine, hyperbolic cosine. So again, I make that similar restriction. I restrict the domain to be zero to infinity. Now when I reflect that over the line y equals x, the blue graph is the graph of the inverse hyperbolic secant function. Hyperbolic cosecant, which was this graph, is one-to-one, -one, and if I reflect that over the line y equals x, I get this blue graph, which is the graph of the inverse hyperbolic cosecant function. That leaves the inverse of hyperbolic cotangent. Here in green was the graph of hyperbolic cotangent. If I reflect over the line y equals x, in blue I see the one-to-one -one graph of the inverse hyperbolic cotangent function. All these graphs can be found in your book. So if you need to refer to the book to determine which picture is which, You'll find that in section 610. Now, much like so-called regular trigonometric functions, there are a lot of identities that end up falling out for these functions. And if you look here at the bottom under the heading identities, uh, we're not going to prove any of these, although you should be able to follow what's going on in the book and perhaps prove a couple of simple ones. So I'll just point to uh, this second one here, which is sort of the analog of the regular or standard Pythagorean identity for regular trig functions. That is the one that says sine squared of x plus cosine squared of x is equal to 1 for all real x. Well, the analog for hyperbolic trig functions is hyperbolic cosine squared minus hyperbolic sine squared equals 1. How would you prove this? Well, you would simply write out the left side. Okay, what would this look like? Just briefly, let's sketch it out. If we were going to try and prove that hyperbolic cosine squared minus hyperbolic sine squared equals 1, the way I could do that would be to 
look at what this left side is. Well, we said hyperbolic cosine was this. So that means we have e to the x plus e to the minus x over 2 squared minus hyperbolic sine, which is e to the x minus e to the minus x over 2 squared. I'm not going to do the proof here, but we would expand each of these and collect like terms. And if you do, you'll find that everything cancels out except for one little piece, which ends up giving you a ratio of 1. And all of the other identities you see here in this list could be proven in a similar way by expanding each of these expressions in terms of the basic e to the x, e to the minus x definitions. And of course, the spooky thing is you'll notice that many of these identities look very similar to trigonometric identities. Um, if we look at this third one, uh, this is the double angle identity for sine, and it looks exactly like this one for hyperbolic sine looks exactly like the one for sine. Um, now, if you look at some of the other ones, you'll see they look very similar, but there are some small differences. Uh, for example, if we come down to this one, which says hyperbolic tangent squared equals 1 minus hyperbolic secant squared, uh, you should remember that the corresponding analog for regular trig functions is 1 plus tan squared equals secant squared. Well, 1 plus tan squared equals secant squared. If we write that out, would be the same thing as saying secant squared minus 1 equals tangent. So notice this right side has an opposite sign of what the similar identity for regular trig functions would look like. So some are exactly the same in appearance, some are slightly different. Notice of course we have just the reciprocal definitions mixed here. Um, scroll down here to the sum formula for hyperbolic sign. Uh, looks exactly like the formula for regular sign. Uh, you'll notice though that the formula for the hyperbolic cosine of a sum is slightly different. There's a sine difference over here on the right side of that identity. Okay, so many, many similarities, and quite interesting that based on such a different definition, we would get many identities that match regular identities for trigonometric functions in, in such a close way. Before we get to derivatives and integrals of these functions, which is really what we're concerned with here, uh, the question might be, uh, what are these functions for? Of course, we're not going to get into that much in this class. I'll just say that uh, there are a couple of very interesting things about the inverse trig functions, uh, one of which is the so-called catenary. So a catenary is a function of the form y equals a times the hyperbolic cosine of x over a. So the a factor, of course, is just some sort of scaling factor. We know that this a outside would be some sort of vertical or horizontal stretch or shrink. I'm sorry, vertical stretch or shrink whereas this a inside is doing some sort of a horizontal stretch or shrink. So this a is affecting the shape of the hyperbolic cosine. And again, we know the hyperbolic cosine is this u graph that has its vertex, if you like, at the point 1, 0. So of course, when I multiply by a on the outside and divide x by a on the inside, I'm affecting the shape of that hyperbolic cosine graph. And so when a, let's say, rope of uniform mass density and unrestricted or relatively unrestricted flexibility is hung, let's say from two points at the same height, then of course that rope hangs in a certain shape. It has a natural shape when hanging under its own weight. That shape is the catenary. Okay, so from a physics point of view, obviously this graph or this function would be pretty important as it describes the shape of a hanging wire or rope 
of uniform mass density and unrestricted flexibility. So the catenary is usually quoted as, as the most important application of the hyperbolic trig functions, in particular the hyperbolic cosine. Um, I will say that in differential equations, both ordinary and partial differential equations, hyperbolic trigonometric functions are the solutions of several important differential equations that you'll find in physics. So you'll see these show up every once in a while um, in this class and the next, but really the, the next serious place you're going to see them applied is in Calc 4. And then beyond that, if you study applications of differential equations or partial differential equations, you'll, you'll see these functions come up every once in a while. Um, the other thing I'd like to look at, which is the, uh, the really interesting thing to me about these functions. So let's look at this picture where I have the graph in blue, which I'll just point out to you is the graph x squared minus y squared equals 1. Uh, we'll talk about that equation in that graph in chapter 9. Uh, but if you've seen it before, you recognize that that's the hyperbola. In fact, in this context, I'm going to call it the unit hyperbola. And if I go back and look at this picture, um, you notice a couple of interesting things. This A is at the point 1, 0, that x-intercept. And then what am I saying here? I'm saying points on the graph of this hyperbola can be found with x and y coordinates that are respectively the hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic sine of some parameter t, some third variable t. So what I mean by that is when I change that t value continuously along an interval, I will trace out the graph of this hyperbola as t ranges over that interval. So this looks familiar to us because, or it should look familiar to us, if we think about what's happening on a so-called unit circle, where of course points such as this point can be referenced by their coordinates in terms of that angle that that line segment or radial segment from the origin to that point makes with the positive x-axis. In this picture, if that angle is theta between that radial line and the positive x-axis, we know from trigonometry that the coordinates of that point on that unit circle are cosine theta, sine theta. Okay, just for a moment, instead of calling that theta like we're used to, let's call it t. So we're not changing anything except calling this angle t, which means this is the point cosine t, sine t. And we know from trigonometry that as t ranges from 0 to 2 pi, we trace this circle once counterclockwise, starting at the point 1, 0, and then ending at that same point. All right, now, interestingly, if I were to ask you, what's the area of this sector? That is, what is the area of this pi piece? Well, of course, we go back to our old trig formula, which says take the area of the entire circle, which would be pi r squared, and take that portion of the circle, which would be measured by the proportion or ratio t over 2 pi. And of course, what I get is tr squared over 2. Or in this case, since this is a unit circle and the radius is 1, I would get t over 2. So a very simple and always interesting formula from trigonometry that says the area of a sector that is swept out or has a central angle of t radians has an area of t over 2. Okay, now let's go back to our picture of the hyperbola. And we're not going to prove this here because really to do it easily, we need something from chapter 9. So we may talk about this again when we get there. Uh, 
but it turns out that the area of this shaded region, which I'll call that a hyperbolic sector, and again, if you think about it, if I did sweep out an angle with the positive x-axis out to a point where I'm terminating with that green radial line, except now where does that radial line reach? Not to the unit circle, but to a point on this unit hyperbola. Well, it turns out the area of this hyperbolic sector is actually t over 2 also. So again, this is a very spooky parallel. In this picture of the circle, when this angle is t radians, the area of this sector is t over 2. In this picture of the hyperbolic or unit hyperbola, the area of this so-called hyperbolic sector is also t over 2, where t is this parameter that's giving me hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic sine at that t as the point on the hyperbolic graph, or the graph of the hyperbola. Now, one thing, this t is not this angle. Let's be clear about that. This t has some other meaning in this picture. But this picture does give you some idea, perhaps, why they're calling these trigonometric functions. They do act very similarly to trigonometric functions in a lot of ways. We can see that from the identities. And now there's even this spooky parallel in terms of areas when I compare this hyperbola with the unit circle. OK, now let's get back to the basics. So let's look at derivatives now. So of course, if I wanted to start out by looking at the derivative with respect to x of hyperbolic sine, OK, the nice thing again about these functions is, since they're defined in such a simple way using exponential functions, I can always fall back on that definition to prove almost anything about these functions. And so we said that hyperbolic sine was e to the x minus e to the minus x over 2. And of course, I know that that's really just the derivative of 1 half times e to the x minus e to the minus x. OK, what's the derivative of e to the x? It's e to the x. What's the derivative of minus e to the minus x? Well, it's minus minus e to the minus x, which is plus e to the minus x. But of course, if I look at what I have for an answer there, I recognize that that's just hyperbolic cosine. OK, again, the weird parallels. The definition of hyperbolic sine gives us that the derivative of hyperbolic sine is just hyperbolic cosine. OK, real quickly, let's look at the derivative of hyperbolic cosine, which should be the derivative of e to the x plus e to the minus x over 2. OK, again, derivative e to the x is e to the x. Derivative e to the minus x is minus e to the minus x. So what do I get for a derivative of hyperbolic cosine? Precisely hyperbolic sine. OK, notice this is where the, the parallels are deviating just a little bit. For a regular cosine function, the derivative of cosine would be negative sine. But for the hyperbolic cosine, the derivative is just hyperbolic sine. So notice these two together say that the derivative of one of these is the other, and vice versa. OK, now from here, we could certainly derive formulas for the derivatives of the other six hyperbolic trig functions in a similar way. And notice if we go back and look at the table, we'll scroll to the top here. Here in these last four lines, you'll see the derivatives of the other four basic hyperbolic trig functions. And, you know, no big surprises here. Hyperbolic tangent, the derivative is hyperbolic secant squared. Derivative hyperbolic cotangent is the negative of hyperbolic secant squared. So those two sound like regular trig functions. Uh, notice down here, though, 
one of these is different from the regular trig function. The derivative of regular secant x is positive secant x tangent x. This one has a negative on it. Other than that, though, again, all these spooky parallels, the derivatives look much like the derivatives of the regular trig functions. Now, let's switch gears and go to the inverse hyperbolic trig functions. And so the next thing to look at is this segment that's titled Evaluating Inverse Hyperbolic Functions. Uh, it should make sense to you that if I'm defining the hyperbolic trig functions in terms of exponentials, then it might make sense that the inverse hyperbolic trig functions would end up being defined in terms of LNs. And that's what this table shows. Each of the six inverse hyperbolic trig functions may be expressed in terms of natural logs. Um, let me show you the proof of just one of these. Uh, you can skip this part of the video if you'd like to move along to the integration section. But just to show us or give us an idea where one of these formulas is coming from, uh, let's look at the proof of the hyperbolic cosine inverse formula. Okay, switching over to our notes. The formula says that the hyperbolic... inverse <coughs> hyperbolic cosine function is equal to the ln of x plus the square root of x squared minus 1. And this is for x greater than or equal to 1. Proof. Well, let's say we had y equals hyperbolic cosine inverse of x for x greater than or equal to 1. Of course, that's the same thing as saying that x equals the hyperbolic cosine function evaluated at y. What is hyperbolic cosine of y? Well, by definition, it's e to the y plus e to the minus y over 2. Or in other words, x equals e to the y plus e to the minus y over 2 which of course is 2x equals e to the y plus e to the minus y. If we multiply both sides by e to the y, we would get 2x e to the y equals e to the 2y plus e to the y times e to the minus y, which would be 1. If we move everything to one side of the equation, we get e to the 2y minus 2x e to the y plus 1 equals 0. If we notice, this is a quadratic function in u. That is if u is equal to e to the y, which means we could solve for u that is, solve for e to the y by using the quadratic formula. And that would be with a equals 1, b equals minus 2x, and c equals 1. And so when I do that, I'm going to get e to the y equals 2x plus or minus the square root of 4x squared minus 4ac, which would be minus 4, over 2a, which would be 2. And notice how nicely that simplifies. It simplifies to x plus or minus the square root of x squared minus 1. Okay, note that if y is equal to 0, that of course implies that e to the y equals 1. Also, if x equals 1, e to the y is equal to 1. If x is equal to 1, y is equal to 0. Uh, 
again, just to remind us, I know that because if x is equal to e to the y plus e to the minus y over 2 and y is 0, then of course x is going to be 1 plus 1 over 2, which is going to be 1. Now, because x equals the hyperbolic cosine of y, and we know the range of the hyperbolic cosine function is 1 to infinity, that of course tells us that this x has to be greater than or equal to 1. Okay, we already know what happens when x is equal to 1. We get e to the y equals 1. What happens if x is greater than 1? Well, if x is greater than 1, we can definitely say the following. Um, x minus 1 would be positive if x was greater than 1, and x minus 1 would be less than x plus 1. Okay, since both of these numbers are positive, we can take the square root of both sides of this inequality, and we know that the result will be true since those are both positive numbers. So that would say that the square root of x minus 1 is less than the square root of x plus 1. If we multiplied both sides of that inequality by the square root of x minus 1, which is a positive number, so again, we know that we're keeping the inequality true. Sorry, color troubles. I want that in red. Okay, if we do that, what happens? Well, of course, the left side just becomes x minus 1. The other side becomes the square root of x squared minus 1. And what does that give us? Well, we could say that gives us that x minus the square root of x squared minus 1 is less than 1. Okay, notice in our solution that we got up here, there were two possibilities. One was that e to the y could be x plus the square root of x squared minus 1, or e to the y could be x minus the square root of x squared minus 1. Okay, notice this one right here says that x minus the square root of x minus 1 is less than 1 if x is greater than 1. But that would say that e to the y is less than 1. But we already know e to the y would have to be greater than 1 if x was greater than 0. Okay, what that tells us is we have a contradiction. This one can't possibly be true. And that makes sense uh, if we're looking at the result we got right here. We can't have this e to the y being two different things. We know e to the y, this basic exponential function, is 1 to 1. It had to be 1 or the other of the plus or minus. And if we were guessing that it should be the plus 1, then that was the right guess. Okay, and of course, that's the identity that we were trying to prove way up here at the top, that that should be an x plus square root of x squared minus 1 inside that log. Now, of course, where are we getting the log? Well, if we're saying, of course, that e to the y is equal to x plus the square root of x squared minus 1. We'll just take the natural log of both sides. They're both positive sides. And that would give us y equals the natural log of x plus the square root of x squared minus 1. And that, of course, told us that hyperbolic cosine inverse x is equal to that logarithm. And this just shows you where that relationship or that equation is coming from. In a similar way, we could derive the other five equations for the other five inverse hyperbolic trig functions. Okay, now let's look at derivatives and integrals of these. And so, just for starters, let's look at the first one. Derivative of hyperbolic inverse functions, inverse sine hyperbolic function. We could start out with y equals inverse hyperbolic sine. 
and you've seen this trick before. We did the same thing when we were determining what the formulas were for the derivatives of the inverse trig functions. That's equivalent to saying x equals the hyperbolic sine of y. That means that dx dy equals the derivative of hyperbolic sine y with respect to y, which is hyperbolic cosine y. Now, if you look back at how we proved the formulas for the derivatives of the regular inverse trig functions, in each case, it was a matter of taking this result that we got when we found dx dy and re-expressing that right side in terms of x by using some identity. Okay, the identity we want here is the one we saw earlier that said the hyperbolic cosine of y minus the hyperbolic sine squared of y equals 1. In other words, hyperbolic cosine squared of y is 1 plus hyperbolic sine squared y. And that means hyperbolic cosine of y is equal to the square root of 1 plus hyperbolic sine squared y. So that says that dx dy is equal to the square root of 1 plus hyperbolic sine squared y. But of course, from where we started, especially that line right there, we know that's really just 1 plus x squared under that square root. And then using our derivative of inverse formula, we know that dy dx will be the reciprocal of that. And so there's our formula for the derivative of the sine inverse function. The derivative of the inverse hyperbolic sine is 1 over the square root 1 plus x squared. Okay, now if we look at the other formulas, and so look up here at the top, and you'll see in this right column the derivatives of the six inverse hyperbolic trig functions. And of course, there's the one we just did, and this is just the chain rule version with x changed to u. And you'll notice when you look down through these formulas that again, in this spooky way, they look much like the formulas of the derivatives of the regular inverse trig functions, um, but with little differences. For example, the derivative of regular tan inverse we know is u prime over 1 plus u squared. Now it's a 1 minus u squared. Um, what about secant inverse u? Well, we know it's u prime, not negative u prime, over absolute value of u square root u squared minus 1. So the big change there is, again, this radicand has negated from what we would see in the derivative, derivative of the regular secant inverse function. Okay, so you notice, again, they look very similar to the derivatives we've seen earlier for the inverse trig functions with mostly little sign differences. Okay, now, of course, if I know these, I can immediately construct integrals that yield these forms. So, for example, I could take this first one that we just proved, and I won't go through the derivation here, but if you recall when we originally derived the formulas for the integrals that lead to the inverse trig functions, uh, we basically redid them so that we could handle an a squared term uh, in each of these derivatives. Okay, that's what they've done here. And so this formula, this first one, is just a little tweaking of this formula. But basically it's saying if I have a u prime over u squared plus an a squared under a square root, that's going to go back to inverse hyperbolic sine function of u over a. All right, now, uh, disclaimer, this is the, uh, the big place to uh, put an asterisk in your notes. Uh, 
the antiderivatives of these five functions you see in the table here do indeed give these inverse trig functions. But what did we just say a few minutes ago? Each of these inverse hyperbolic trig functions may be expressed in terms of logs. That means each of these answers we're getting for these antiderivatives could be expressed in terms of logs using these formulas. Okay, here's, here's the thing to star in your notes. When we get to the next chapter, we're going to study a method that will get us directly to these answers without using the inverse hyperbolic trig functions at all. So starting in the next chapter when we learn that technique, we will really not use inverse hyperbolic trig functions to write answers to these integrals anymore. That is, once we learn that technique, if we're integrating something like the integral of du over a squared minus u squared, we won't write our answer from this formula where we know it's an inverse hyperbolic tangent or inverse, inverse hyperbolic cotangent. We'll use the other technique that we're going to learn and what we'll get directly from that method is the corresponding log expression from down here that would equal one of these two answers. So of course hyperbolic tan inverse would end up looking something like this one, some sort of a log of 1 plus x over 1 minus x. So just remember this when we get to that part in the next chapter. We'll be integrating them. The answers would be inverse hyperbolic trig functions from what we're seeing here but we will not even appeal to those functions. We'll go straight to these log expressions, and we won't really even mention the inverse hyperbolic trig functions. Okay, so the main thing I want you to do with this section is just do a little bit of homework just to become familiar with the functions, uh, to know they're there, to know how to take the derivatives, Integration, we're not going to worry about so much because we're going to deal with that in the next chapter. Okay, let me know if you have any questions. That's a good place to stop.